it is David Lucky. He's going to talk about pre-hospital anesthesia. Okay, good evening everyone. Um, I'm talking about pre-hospital anaesthesia, so we're sort of um, touching on some of the things we touched on this morning. Did you see those talks this morning? Wow, they were pretty cool, weren't they? I mean, I think um, I I'm feeling a bit embarrassed now. I think I'm working in some sort of techno time warp of low-tech activity because I've got no flashing lights, no gadgets, nothing, and I felt slightly dispirited after that. My message from this morning was the kit is quite exciting and um, there's all sorts of things and that we need to have a plan when we're doing area management. So I added an extra slide in. I've got um, a laryngoscope. I know it's a bit disappointing. And, uh, and in terms of a plan, I think my overall plan is make a decision to RSI, successfully intubate on the first attempt and then congratulate myself afterwards. Now I know you have to have a system in place to make that happen. And I think Although I'm going to talk about some of the things that uh, people talked about this morning, my talk is hopefully a little bit more um, big picture. And I think um, one of the things you have to ask is why are we still justifying this? We've been doing pre-hospital RSI for 10, 20, 30 years. And we're still having our in-hospital colleagues asking us, why do we do that? Where do you have to do it? Who should do it? All these sorts of basic things. And it is interesting to see why we're still having to justify this stuff. Now, from the slide that I've just shown you before, you might think, oh, dear, this is all going to be so basic. It's not basic. I'll show you what basic is. Do you want me to uh, put that on? Yeah, some of you may have seen this before, but I love it, so I'm going to show it again. The advantage of ether, as we've seen, is that it can be given with very few accessories. Every general practitioner will carry in his bag a bottle of ether, a mask, a gag, and an artificial airway. It's useful in remote country districts where there's no skilled assistance at hand. You may need it in emergency. For instance, a road accident. Or as a standby on active service. Although it's a simple way of giving an anaesthetic, it needs quite as much skill and attention as any more elaborate method. See? See? Right, so, um, so, so that's pretty basic, isn't it? And actually, we have come on an awful lot since then. Um, and, you know, some of the stuff... And one of the things that uh, we managed to slip in as an editorial quite recently was um, to an anaesthetic journal was talking about the fact that actually when our doctors come and work with us on in pre-hospital emergency medicine and learn how to give an anaesthetic pre-hospitally and do all the things that we do around it to make it safe, sometimes they go back to their emergency or their anaesthetic practice and actually feel that the, the safety of the anaesthetic they're giving the emergency department is less safe than pre-hospital. So perhaps pre-hospital anaesthesia is no longer the poor relative of, uh, of emergency department anaesthesia. So the first question, do we really need it? Well, of course we do, don't we? We know that. And we come back to this diagram, which I'm sure most of you have seen before, which is what we use to justify anything um, advanced in pre-hospital emergency medicine. The idea is that um, the availability of interventions in a sort of standard place may only come to fruition when you're actually in the proper hospital or a big hospital or the right hospital. And meanwhile, the interventions that you want to produce are becoming less effective with time. So by the time you actually get to do them, they're not effective anymore. That's why we do pre-hospital emergency medicine, bring the interventions back here. And of course, airway compromise is one of those things that can't wait. So that's why we do it. And this also brings us to um, the concept of critical care without walls in hospital, the idea that patients with the same deranged physiology and the same, um, 
the same issues and disease processes are treated differently depending on where they are. And it's the same thing. If someone needs something doing in the pre-hospital environment, we should aim to do it there and not wait until we're comfortable provided by which time it's too late. There's lots of historical stuff on this. Um, when you actually look at um, some of this is a meta-analysis and some guidelines, 70% of patients that need emergency intubation have to wait too long for it, and they have to wait until they get into a trauma center. That's US data. Um, the UK NCPOD study from 2007 found that there were 17% of the major trauma patients had um, airway compromise, be it partial or, um, or complete obstruction of their airway. That's not the important thing. The important thing is they were attended by the ambulance service in most cases, and two-thirds of them still had the airway problems when they actually arrived in hospital. So we did need it. And this one is a, an emergency department one, looking at the patients that were intubated immediately on arrival in the emergency department. And if you look at them, you find that the indications were airway obstruction, hypoxia, cardiac arrest, that sort of stuff. These are not things that happen as you cross the threshold to the emergency department probably like to have been there before. Is that better? Um, so we looked at this a little in a little bit more detail. And it's very, very difficult to look at this, to be, to be honest. Um, but this is what we did. We looked at patients that were attended by our air ambulance who needed airway interventions that had already been attended by the ambulance service first. There's a few things. This is the amount, this is the number of interventions we did in, I think it was about a year period. The first thing to notice is 472. Look how many um, calls the ambulance service received in the same period. This is not a common thing. It really isn't. Um, but actually, when you look at those 472 patients, 200 had had interventions that actually not didn't have airway compromise when we got there, but 268 did. And that was either because the airway interventions up to but not including RSI weren't working or they haven't been done properly. Either way, it implied to me that there is still a need for, for um, RSI in a small number of patients. So we, um, we produced some guidelines um, from the Association of Anaesthetists in 2009 and redid them in 2017, um, and it seems to have been cited reasonably highly. What did we look at? Well, we, first of all, we acknowledge the differences in pre-hospital emergency medicine, which you'll be aware of, tricky patients, environmental factors, etc. Actually, everyone got out of this uh, without injuries. I just happened to be passing. Um, so what did we look at? We looked at what the local organization should provide, techniques. We were quite light on technique, and I'll tell you why in a minute. The role of sedation, who should do it, and how, they sh how should they be trained, the equipment and monitoring, transport, which is actually covered in the intensive care guidelines, and then a few other little things at the end there. There was a consistent message. It's all very straightforward. If you don't really know about this stuff and you're trying to think, what should we actually achieve? The answer is we should aim to achieve exactly the same outside hospital when we anaesthetize someone as we do in the emergency department. That's the standard because it's the same patient with the same problems. Why would we have a different standard? And there are some easy bits. The local organization should provide someone that's actually taking responsibility for overseeing airway management, which means training, review, and making sure that supervision is there when it's required. In terms of the governance structure, um, the governance structure has to ensure that the people that are doing it are competent to do so, look after data collection, feedback, and produce guidelines which are relevant locally as well as nationally. For those of you that had smooth running lives before you had children like me, you'll know that any process can be ruined by the uh, insertion of children, um, and pre-hospital anaesthesia is, uh, is no different to that. Basically, we had to say something about it, because otherwise it messed everything up. We recognize it's a subspecialist area. We recognize that you have to look at your local skills. If your entire air ambulance is run by first year, I don't know, surgeons or ED people, it's going to be different than if there's five pediatric consultant anaesthetists. Um, there is a higher threshold for RSI. And actually, when you look carefully at it, most patients can be managed without RSI. However, the evidence is, and this is just one paper from our system that Dan Nevin wrote, was that actually, um, if you look at complications and intubation success in children, it's at least as high as adults, thankfully. So if you do have to do it, it should be fine. In terms of equipment and monitoring, again, it's straight straightforward. With the, with the monitoring that's available at the moment, there's no excuse for not having the same level of monitoring as in hospital. So that's easy. Drugs, a little bit more tricky. A little bit more tricky. It was alluded to this morning. I think what we're seeing is 
certainly in Europe and elsewhere, there is increased consistency. And I think ketamine is being used an awful lot outside hospital and for trauma. Are there any Germans here? No, I have been out uh, occasionally. With there's a, you've got an awful lot of drugs on your side. Here. You've got more drugs and kit on your cars than I have in my hospital. It's quite scary. But most people are consistent. Um, and actually, you can get over this because actually, if I if I am an outlier and I want to use fire and sucks or some antiquated thing like that, if I've done it forty thousand times and I know how to use it, actually, it probably is safe. But for most people, we don't do that. And what we're looking at there is this mixture here: the difference between moving towards a standard generalized thing and limiting choice, and a bespoke anaesthetic. And I think if you have departments which are run by consultant anaesthetists outside hospital. You might tip a little bit towards the other way because they feel unhappy without having all their drugs available. But the majority of the time, we're perfectly happy to move towards a more standard approach. We did safe anesthesia in dangerous environments. I think the take-home message from that is that people are shooting at you. It's probably not the time to do anesthesia. Other guidelines have come out recently. The American guidelines are OK. They're fairly sketchy. Um, the Scandinavian guidelines that have come out are actually pretty good and actually deal with some fairly controversial issues, particularly around C-spine control um, and, um, and who should do what. So they're much more prescriptive than we were able to be. There are more difficult bits, of course. And I, I know I'm not allowed to have um, 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 too much text on the slide, but it's in this one because it was a bit difficult. So how do we decide who should be doing it? And it's really difficult. Well, the bottom line is very straightforward. If we're using what I said earlier, which is the same standards, you shouldn't have someone out working outside hospital that you wouldn't be prepared to send down to the emergency department and anaesthetize a difficult trauma or medical patient. So competencies with no performance but unsupervised um, RSI in the ED. The initial assessment of competence which allows you to do gynealis is not, not appropriate. And you do need both anaesthetic and pre-hospital skills. You should initially supervise. You should have trained assistants. How many anaesthetics do you have to give to remain competent? I don't know. Absolutely no idea. I do think that if you've done 10,000 in the past, then your skill scale will be a lot less, but it's still very difficult. Um, we sort of, once a month, that was talked about. I don't know whether that's right. And I think it depends very much on in-hospital practice. And I have to say, from my own perspective, I do question whether people who are doing very infrequent pre-hospital anaesthesia and no in-hospital anaesthesia, whether they can maintain their competence for long periods of time. I don't think I would. So maybe I'm particularly special. Um, so non-physician RSI, we did have to address it a little bit. Um, it is carried out in a minority of EMS systems worldwide. And there are some extremely good performance in systems that train people extraordinarily well and hard. But there's also some shocking performance published out there. You know, um, intubation failure rates of more than 15% after muscle relaxant. That's quite scary, isn't it? And I have to say, talking to people, I think an awful lot of this stuff, of course, isn't published. Why would you? Um, so we decided that um, basically in the UK at the moment, anesthesia outside the doctor, paramedic, or doctor, nurse, whatever you're using, um, is not in place to train those people. So um, we looked at this in two th back in 2012, and there's no doubt that doctors were had a higher intubation success rate. It's not actually the intubation success rate you've got to look at, it's the failure rate, which is quite important. But of course they should, shouldn't they? It's a bit like anaesthetists have a lower failure rate than emergency physicians. Well, they should be, that's what they do. They stick tubes down all the time, or they used to. Um, but actually, you have to be very careful interpreting this data, because quite often it's not about doctors and paramedics. It's about drugs and not drugs. Because lots of paramedics are not using drugs, which makes it extremely difficult. And I suspect that if we tried to put tubes down um, all the airway experts in this room without drugs, it's not actually that easy. Um, we did the same criteria a, a few um, few years ago. It was 2017. And what was interesting was that the amount of data available had got much, much bigger. So there to there. Actually, it looks as though things have got better for every group. Um, but there's still a big difference. Does intubation failure matter? Does it? Well, you'll know that it's only part of the thing. It's just one um, one quality indicator of anaesthesia. And there's all these things that can be hidden away there. Poor ventilation, multiple attempts, hypoxemia and hypotension. But yeah, it does matter, actually. Um, if you look at the NAP4 study and this closed claims analysis of um, severe brain injury and death in anaesthesia, um, 
it, this is what they're about. They're about failed intubation after muscle relaxants. Now that may be because the system in place isn't very good, but it's still pretty, pretty, uh, pretty important. If you do something like, so say we decided to move from one group of people who have an intubation failure rate of X and moved it to another group, Y, to see whether uh, that, that would be a good idea. If we put it into the NHS risk matrix, which is where you look at the nature of the problem, the frequency and the potential consequences, and looked at um, that number of increased failed intubations, I think it would come under the extreme risk category, which means you have to ring your chief exec immediately. So who knows where that's going. The bottom line is, if you've got something that's very difficult, the person that's most experienced is most likely to get the tube down. And this is the, this is a, a German paper looking at proficient and expert intubators. I don't think I actually meet the criteria for expert. I think it's 300 intubations a year or something outrageous like that, which I don't think many of us do, even people in full-time anaesthetic practice possibly. So what about failed intubation? We talked a little bit about that this morning. Obviously, you have less equipment. If you are going to use a superglottic airway, it needs to be uh, second generation. Um, surgical airway, I'm allowed to call it that? Do you want me to call it that other thing that I don't like? Front of neck access. I, I've never understood why. We've never done back of neck or side of neck access. Why we have to call it front of neck access, but who am I to say? I'll be drinking on my own tonight, I can tell. Um, scalpel versus devices. There is no good evidence that any of the devices available on the market are better than a simple technique, a simple scalpel technique. And an awful lot of the devices don't seem to have been used much in anger at all. Um, and I think that there seems to be consensus that needle cricothyroidotomy is a bit of a waste of time. So when we've got all of these devices, do we really need to worry about failed intubations? I don't know. But this was um, an admittedly slightly flawed uh, meta-analysis of, um, of airway um, rescues. And basically, there were lots of problems, but there was a 17% failure rate using, um, using superglottic devices, which is quite high, isn't it? So we have to have something up our sleeve if that doesn't work. Sedation, we heard a little bit about this morning, how to make your ever like this. Um, it is very important to pre oxygenate someone well to do that. And actually, we had that in the 2009 anaesthetic guidelines, so six years before this, it was called delayed sequence intubation. Palm, we heard about that this morning as well. Um, and I think, yes, it does sound like a good idea, doesn't it? You sedate someone to put in an LMA who's got airway compromise. It's sort of a good idea. The only problem is, um, in some patients, I suspect it will make them worse. And you've just got to work out how many people are going to do it, how many they're going to do it to, how many patients are going to make better, and how many they're going to make worse. The Royal College of Anita has decided not to back a consensus document on that. We've got target times. NICE, which is, um, produces national guidelines for us in trauma, decided that the target time for OA and venous compromise, that RSI should be performed as soon as possible or within 45 minutes. Now, I can't hold my, heart, my breath for 45 minutes, but I, I think what this has actually done, it's a slightly odd timeline, isn't it? I think what it means is that, bearing in mind that most patients, trauma patients, take about 45 minutes to get to hospital, the answer is that you probably need to have provision to do it pre-hospital, which is probably good for us. Um, the other thing is, is it better to do the RSI outside or in hospital? And Espen Furbone from Norway and Zane Perkins from, um, from the Royal London did this. I have to say, if they do another systematic review, they'll be mad. Because looking at the data from this just gave me a headache. It was horrific, absolutely horrific. Really um, difficult data to manage. And of course, the answer is, you can never get around the fact that the reason I choose to anaesthetize you rather than you is not just because of the physiology, it's because I recognise that you're sicker than you are. And it doesn't seem to be possible to get around that. So the answer is, um, the patients who are intubated in the emergency department seem to be less sick and always do better than the other group. However, we have had a look at some um, data, which we haven't quite published yet, um, from TARN. And looking at all acute airway interventions in the trauma patients, uh, 11,000 of them had it, Mortality was 28%. So these are this does meet the criteria for this conference. These patients are sick. That's quite high, isn't it? Now, the pre-hospital intubation patients, 33%, 0.7 died. And the emergency department ones, 21.3. So exactly the same as what I showed you before. However, there's another group of patients who I think is more important. This group, the patients that were intubated in the emergency department who had interventions done to their airway, like airways introduced or LMAs or whatever, um, but not RSI. I suspect this is representative of the group who couldn't actually have an RSI performed on site because there wasn't actually the team available. And if you look at their uh, mortality, it's actually incredibly high, which is sort of what we know all the time, isn't it, I think? 
it's been difficult to prove. What about um, patients not to anaesthetise? Well, we published this a while ago, which looked at um, shocked patients who are awake and should they uh, should they be um, put to sleep. And actually, it's pretty it's quite difficult to do a study like this. It was retrospective. There was all sorts of issues, and it's difficult to do a study like this. Um, and there was increased mortality in the patients that had anaesthesia pre hospital. And I think most people that have anaesthetised people in the emergency department will know that actually you do want to have all sorts of things available when you put someone to sleep, be it blood, a surgeon to turn the tap off or whatever. And if you do put someone to sleep in a position where you're a long way from doing those things, some of them don't very well, do very well. For most patients, it's incredibly straightforward. You look at them and you think, yeah, they need to go to sleep. Um, but for some, it isn't. So maybe we should did consider delay in some cases. I don't know. And also, the role of pre-hospital blood may change some of this. There are other things that you could do. Um, Keith Lurie, who invented the, um, um, the uh, what should we call it, valve, uh, impedance valve. Um, this is some early work on this, looking at if you have central hypovolemia in pigs and you look at um, bleeding them out, if you put uh, an active ITD on them, you buy more time. So basically, this is a time, this is a survival, and they're going down. So maybe, maybe there's a, a, a hint that uh, we could use something like that. Because what it should do is lower the intrathoracic pressure, lower the ICP, uh, refills the heart, increases your preload, um, and, and improves your cerebral and your um, systemic circulation. And these are the devices that you can use. And this is the airway pressures going down. So this is for ventilator patients. And this is for spontaneously breathing. And this is what happens. The tracheal press pressure goes down. The aortic pressure goes up. The intracranial pressure goes down. So the head injury stuff is something that I haven't really thought about very much. But it's interesting. Um, and this is it in uh, this is again in pigs. This is what happens if you put the, the valve on. It basically buys you time, and maybe something along that, like with 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 blood, could actually buy us more time. Whether you can use it in spontaneously breathing patients, I don't know. But there have been cases where people have put them on, and someone's gone from being very confused and agitated to actually becoming quite with it again for a while. So, how do we move these things from pre from hospital to pre hospital um, practice? And these are the sort of things that were talked about this morning. Uh, lung protective strategies. Obviously, I've, I'm not sure what negative pressure ventilation would do for that. You'd have to balance your, uh, your stuff. End tidal CO2. This is um, our, our monthly data where we look at um, uh, whether we've met our targets for hypo and hypoventilation. But it does occur to me, those are people that I was fiddling around with an anaesthetic machine the other day. And you can now get the anaesthetic machine to ventilate to a particular end tidal agent. And it does occur to me that if we think, as we do, that ventilation is so important in head injuries, why can't we link up the ventilator to ventilate to a specific end tidal CO2? There's no reason why we can't do it at all. In fact, the algorithms already exist. Now, of course, you'd have to keep a careful eye on it, but it is possible. Um, apneic oxygenation, we talked about this morning. I think you should use it, and we've been doing we've been doing it for quite some time now. But the results are mixed, as we heard this morning, and I think it depends. It doesn't work if your airway is not patent. Um, Good pre-oxygenation and positioning can alter things. Um, the flow rates we heard about this morning can be different. And if you're putting the tube down quickly, then you're not going to see a difference, are you, in, in a large group of patients? So if you're putting it down in 95% of the time in, you know, in two minutes, then you're probably not going to see a difference between the two groups. Video laryngoscopy. I'm constantly hearing about, in my service, patients that basically had uh, difficulty with intubation. They had a video laryngoscopy, and then we gave up with that and went back to a standard laryngoscope. And I'm just thinking, there's something wrong here. So again, which device, which blade, training, and airway contamination seem to be the issues. So good performance is more based on human factors, training, and team attitude, combined with sound decision making, than the specific anesthetic technique that we're using. Can we play that video for a second? I think it's always good to see things done. Not, I hope this isn't in your emergency department. I'm not entirely sure where it's from. But I just like the idea that there's a patient who's in the emergency department bagging himself. Which is a bit shocking, really, isn't it? Yeah, and he's not overventilating him. So he's, you know. Okay. Um, so, I've talked about this. I, I'm just going to go on for another couple of minutes and then I'm going to stop. So, we've got all these things here, all these exciting new techniques. Are they actually improving pre hospital anesthesia? You know, sort of confirming intubation. Oh, so God, what are we doing with that? This is horror. I, it might not be improving things, I think. Oh, dear. What have I said? 
I think that we have this situation, certainly in hospital and to some degree out of hospital, in that if you put process into a poorly performing system, it gets better very quickly. And that's what happens. You put those guidelines in somewhere where it's a disaster, it works really well. But there is a point at inflection on this curve where I think the quality of care does not necessarily continue to improve the more stuff you put in place. And I think as leaders, and there's a number of leaders in this room, it's incumbent on all of us to make sure that if we have process in place, it has a purpose. If it doesn't, take it away and throw it in the bin. That's my controversy for the day. I watched this son, uh, Sully with my this um, film, Sully with my son again um, the other day, which is a brilliant film. And he's gone into talking. Of, this is the guy that landed his plane on the on the Hudson River, um, and basically didn't have time to do all of his checklists. He just had to eyeball it and go for it. And uh, it was used in some of the CRM community as an idea that sometimes you just need to wing it. But he makes the point that you do, you do experience does give you the option of winging it, of not doing all the things. But it only works winging it from a system that normally works and has process in it. And I can sort of see that. Yeah, do you like this? We must make process our slaves and not be slaves to process. You don't like it. No, no, I, I thought it was really cool. But anyway, but that's what I think we should be doing. And if you don't, you do need you do need process. You do need process. I was doing a tracheostomy and it did went a bit pear shaped and um and we had prepared. Um so I asked for a laryngeal mask size five and I was given this. And I I hadn't checked, obviously. Um, but I was told by the nurse in no uncertain terms that she had checked, and that's what it said on the label. So there I was. I used to be a gynecologist uh, when I started out in medicine, but I still couldn't really achieve my, my tracheostomy with that. So I think what we need to do is rediscover rapid sequence induction. Because at the moment, sometimes, the decision time when an RSI is decided that it's going to be performed and putting the tube in, I've got time to go and do my tax return while it's actually going on. And I think we do need to remember that there needs to be a little bit of a pace in all this. And that an aggressive mental attitude that this tube is going down there is actually something which is something quite difficult to put into guidelines. But I think it's responsible for quite a lot more success. So aim to achieve the same standards in hospital anesthesia. If you can't do it well in your system, you should stick to basic airway management, which is high quality. Difficult, difficult pre-hospital conditions aren't an excuse for poor performance. And process is essential but not too much. You also have to individualise it for your own system because things are different in different places. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, David. Um, while Sophie Hamada from Paris is preparing the next lecture, are there any questions for David? After Sophie, there'll be a short break, about 15 minutes. So you can wait until then to get coffee, maybe, unless it's very pressing. No questions for David? Yeah, so there's a question. David, are you ready? David, thank you very much. <laughs> um, so you make the point that uh, possibly the checklists have gotten a little too long. And of course, that's very dependent on the individual checklist. But my question would be, because we heard this morning uh, that most of the time we don't instantly need to put a tube down the throat. Uh, how often does it actually occur that the checklist is too long in the pre-hospital setting? Okay, um, we can continue this discussion up in, yeah.
Okay, I'm going to cut you off there. Um, Sophie, take it away. So, good afternoon, everyone. So, D Daniel asked me to make a talk about leprechauns, but I did not agree, <laughs> um, especially when I looked in uh, Wikipedia what was a leprechaun. So, I had to choose a talk because Tim refused to make a procon with me. So, <laughs> so, I had to choose, and I want to speak to you about trauma leader. And my first slide will be a French reference. Is there any French in the room? Okay, thank you. <laughs> we are surrounded. <laughs> so anyway, and I will begin by excuse my French for the native speaker uh, for the whole talk. So, so trauma research is like um, a concert of classical music. It's uh, intense and it's the result of a teamwork. With no position, you have no music. With good musician, you have good music. With bad musician, you have bad music. But with no conductor, you have a mess. And the conductor is here to give its passion, to give sound to the music, and to drive the whole team to make uh, what they have to do. So trauma team is a bunch of individuals put together to make a kind of music which is very rewarding, which is saving life. And depending on where you are, in which country you are, it's a different organization, but you will always find uh, a, a doctor, a surgeon, an emergency doctor or anesthetist or intensivist, a surgeon, nurse, and uh, some staff around to make diagnosis. So it's almost the same, just depending on your resources. And especially in structures where you have elective care competing with emergency care. So that's not in big American center, for example, but in my center, we have competing interest between <laughs> uh, elective surgery and elective care, um, emergency care. So the trauma call is when the team rises. Um, I mean, everyone is doing what they have to do. They are consultation, operating, or taking care of other patients. And there, they are activated to work together as a team and <coughs> to be, I mean, to be at the same time, the same place, in the same unit of place to take care of the same patient. And when the team gathers here, it depends on where you find yourself, in which country. Because when I went with my friend Tobias in the Royal London Hospital 10 years ago, and we sat there in the corner and there was a trauma call, so we were very excited. And we saw one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, ten, fifteen, eighteen people around in the room. We felt, oh my God, what's happening? And what happening was that? It was like a, a school of sardines, just turning around, very silent, very properly, no mess. It was very interesting because in our hospital, it's a chicken house. It's really messy. It's really noisy and there are a lot of fights, ego, it's, it's a mess compared to here. So it's like we have to do it sometimes, the English style. So we try to do that. <laughs> well, it's not yet improved. But <laughs> so the work of the team leader begins by anticipation. First of all, it's um, a long-term anticipation because to be a good leader, you have to be liked by the people you're going to work with. So to be liked, it's a fruit of daily life and your behavior uh, every day, so that you have the biggest momentum of sympathy, the biggest momentum of, um, of uh, confidence from the team. And so they would like to do everything to work for you, but for the team. But you have also an anticipation for the proper case of the patient. And now you have to get control of the square of you patient, the chicken house, and uh, the research. And for that, you have to be in the right state of mind and the, the right cognitive state to take control of your emotions and to take control of uh, your thoughts. So it's, it's called metacognition, so it's beyond cognition. You have to be aware that you are aware. So maybe it's not a square, it's a pentagon. I mean, you're five because you're two in this one. So I'm not schizophrenic, don't worry. 
And uh, so from now, you're going to be aware of what you do, how you speak, how you speak to people, how you craft your language, how you craft your sentence, how you stand up, how you behave. Anticipation also comes from the trauma call. So you have to get in your hospital, depending if it's a trauma center or not, you have to get an activation code. Whether it's the red flag, this is our uh, code of activation, but you can have red code, black code, whatever the color, but you have to have a level of activation so that you can't block the elective care system all the time, otherwise nobody is gonna follow you. So it is if it's a severe patient, you will just flag and say, okay, this is a severe patient, just uh, concentrate and be focused and uh, stop uh, the, the care in uh, this room and we will have a backup if we have to go to the other one. So once you have anticipated, you can brief the team. And so you will be the captain and you have all the team gathering and connecting so that you will have them in the journey with you. And it's the time for the team of the boat, the journey, to share a mental model and to share the information and to um, also know each individual, allocate tasks, prepare the resource, uh, check the material, prepare the material, have the blood, have the warmer, have everything ready for the patient to arrive. And you can even rehearse together, especially if, we, if you don't have um, the habit to work together, you can rehearse uh, the, the actions with, with the team. Once everything is prepared and before the patient arrival, you can have the primary need. So it's a uh, triple C in French, but you can choose your primary need, but you need to say to the team that uh, it's gonna be probably a long time because sometimes it can, it can go on for four to six hours with the same patient. So the handover is a very, very demanding uh, time and very difficult, especially in Latin countries, so in the chicken house, because <laughs> it's, uh, it's not like in UK, for example, where it's very coordinated. And we thought seeing at the handover at, oh my God, they are like robots. But in France, for example, it's different. And this time is very challenging because it has to go fast, because one team has to slow down and give uh, the baton to the next team, but the next team want to focus and to go fast. So it's really difficult to, to have them uh, properly connected and to share all together the same information. <coughs> then the job of the trauma leader will be to, to identify the vital failure, diagnose, and to gather all the clues to make the good decision at the end uh, for the patient. And uh, always uh, communicating on a closed loop with the whole team. So all the team is gonna gather all the clues from the physiology uh, parameter, from the di um, diagnostic techniques like fast echo, x-rays, and uh, is gonna think about what to do about uh, ident identifying the um, leading sources, thinking about um, resuscitating the brain properly, whatever. But this time can be very rewarding because it's kind of, uh, um, we call it a hypofrontality flow. You can feel it very good, like surfing with your knowledge and surfing with your uh, practice and experience. But I have to break an illusion. Because we think we are like superhero and we are multitasking doctors and we are performant, but when you look at neuroscience works, in fact, you have a limited bandwidth to 110 bits per second. When you imagine that speaking normally to a, an adult is already 60 bits per second, you can see that we are quite limited. So what's the lifeline to, to, to be performant and to, to do everything we have to do in such a uh, very stressing and time critical context? So we have a few of them. First of all, you have to keep calm because you are aggressed by many stimulation 
emotions, uh, sights, and uh, also noise, and sometimes smells. And you have to control all of this. And we take example for uh, to control the hormonal release, for example, just by breathing and controlling your emotions. Then you just have to stick to soaps and checklists. This is very useful at that time because you may forget something. So if you have the soap, it's not because you are stupid, it's just because you need it. And this we have learned a lot from the aerodynamic, um, aeronautic uh, teams. And uh, we have progressed a lot by copying what they are doing. Then you can also be helped by cognitive aids and uh, really, really simple stuff. And then also you have to kiss. So it's not because of French skills about kissing. It's just to keep it simple. Keep it simple, stupid. Whatever you do, you have to keep it simple. That's your lifeline. And being aware of also your bias, your cognitive bias, is a good point to avoid them. So let's make a test. Maybe some of you know it, uh, but uh, please do it till the end, and we're going to discuss about that after. Let's move on. So the game is to <laughs> count how many times the player wearing the white shirt passes the ball. If you have the right count, we'll win something. <laughs> so how many? all have 16. So this is just about selective attention. So what in cognitive science, they say that for the, the people who don't know this test, half of them will miss the gorilla going in the middle of the, the players. But there are also other details. For example, one of the player, the black team leaves the room, and also the curtain is changing color. So just look at this. So if you step back and you don't count anymore, it's really easy to spot the gorilla, isn't it? But if, if you focused on the number, on the white players, because it's mixing, you can miss it. So it's the same in the recess. If you focused on something and you're narrowing your, uh, your view of the patient and you're just keeping focusing on something, it's called the tunnel effect. You might miss something and you might uh, involve all the team and the patient with you and might conclude to the wrong decision at the end for your decisional matrix. So how come can you avoid that? First of all, it's better to have hands off. This is really easy to say, but most of the time it's not really easy to do. We know, especially at night when we are uh, in limited resources. So the trauma leader has to keep far from the technical uh, interaction with the patient. And then also for your uh, brain, you need to slow down every about 10 minutes, step back and just share the mental model with the team and rehearse and repeat what you have and you what you synthesize about the patient. And th this is very useful because if you miss something, someone will tell you, oh, don't have the right hemoglobin. This is, and you can just step back on the right track just by doing that. So finally, to achieve goals, um, is your specialty something that can help you to achieve goals? I mean, we made um, a survey a few years ago in Europe just to know who are the trauma leaders in Europe, and it's almost half of them surgeon, and half doctors, intensivists, anesthetists, or emergency medical doctors. But in the literature, whether you are a surgeon or an intensivist or an anesthetist doesn't change anything in the outcome. No team has shown that it's better to be a surgeon or to be a, an intensivist. 
except in some um, literary uh, papers, but it's more for the care after the initial research. Something has not to interfere with you, it's hierarchy. This is very difficult to say in English, but this is also very difficult to deal with in real life. Because if this is the surgeon and you are the young trainee being the trauma leader uh, at night and he has a plan to do uh, the next morning his private consultation and not to be tired, not to be smelly and not to have a brown, brown color under the eyes, he's going to say, you have to bring this patient to the CT scan. And you say, no, I don't want to take this patient to the CT scan. We need to go to the OR. Okay, this is French uh, scene because our surgeons, they never want to operate because they are less and less trained and we do a lot with interventional radiology. So they always push us to, to make without them. But sometimes we need them. I say, no, we have to go to the OR. I say, no, no, your patient is okay. I say, oh, look, he has a very important hemoperitoneum. No, you can diagnose the volume of hemoperitoneum with your fascicle. Of, of course I can. <laughs> so after a while, he's going to go to the OR. And this is a, a real story. It's just, where is Hamada? I say, I'm here. Look, there's nothing. And I was just waiting for the suction. And when I heard, <laughs> I was so happy. <laughs> there was one and a half liter in the belly. And it's just, I didn't say anything. This is just shut his mouth. But I mean, if, if I didn't wait and uh, fight against him, I would have made the wrong choice. On the other, on the other side, uh, it's also level of experience. If you are very experienced and you have a young Padawan being the surgeon, <laughs> he's going to be very afraid of, of doing what you ask him to do. And you may help, help him to call for help, for example, or to just justify what you need from him and he won't be aggressive anymore. He just follow the team and be in the boat all together. So when we speak about leadership, and uh, it, it's like an intangible thing that makes you, makes things happen and, and make um, you achieve goals in your, uh, in your patients. But when you ask people, uh, and there is a study like this, interviewing people in the trauma team and say, well, what's leadership, good leadership for you? Is it a good leader? There is a lot about knowledge and technical skills and experience, finally. And experience, you will have gained more, more and more non-technical skills also. And when you compare the outcome between patients, um, between, sorry, trauma leader being so consultant or being junior, and this is a, the excess of survival, you can see that the better your experience, the better you do for the survival of the patient. But you can see also that there is a wide confidence interval. So we do not progress the same way about leadership and making things happen. And this is in neuroscience called the Dunning-Kruger effect or it's overconfidence effect, it's a cognitive bias, making the inexperienced um, trauma leader, for example, being very confident because they don't know they don't know. And then they begin to know they don't know. We have that because I will ask you after a few beer. <laughs> Here they begin to know they don't know. Here they know they don't know. And then they begin to know they know. And then they are experts when they know that they know. The very dangerous are here. And it will remind you of maybe some of your colleagues. Uh, I have some of mine here. And also, it's very important for a trauma leader to be a good follower. Uh, and this is a saying from Aristotle. He who cannot be a good follower cannot be a good leader. But I also could have cited Mark Twain saying, you have two ears and one mouth, it's to listen twice as much as we speak. And as a leader, it's very important to listen to the team and to listen to the advice. Not taking everyone as such, but just to listen to what the, the team have to say. 
So achieving to be a good trauma leader is all of that. You have to mix, to make a very smart mix of all the qualities of samurai for anticipation, preparedness, um, awareness of Master Yoda for the big ears to listen and also for the wisdom, the calm, the serenity. You have to gain experience and in the most difficult case you have to be authoritative even if the team is trained it's uh, in this patient yeah, that you have to be the most uh, directive like military directive. You have a, a few lifelines uh, the soaps, uh, the, the, um, the checklists, and uh, also the keeping it this thing simple. You have to know when you don't know, and all of that can help you achieve goals, uh, probably the, the best way. But you also have not to forget about after a big research, uh, very intense, you have to debrief the team and like this, you are an actor of a quality improvement program for you and for the team so that they can discuss about what was good, what was not good, and maybe making things change by the, the will of quality. So I think this is it. Thank you for attention. So, are there any questions for Sophie? Okay, so we're going to have a break. We'll be starting up again at quarter two. Uh, two important informations first. Please remember the Hamilton questionnaire. Um, you fill it out, you enter a uh, price.
¿Ah? Pues sí. Te estoy diciendo una no. Es muy divertido jugar a... <risa> ok. En an orderly fashion, please take your seats. Okay, everybody, we're going to start off. So this awesome venue and this conference wouldn't be happening if it weren't for our awesome sponsors. Jonathan represents Bell Helicopters, and uh, our own Oliver and Jonathan is going to give us a short presentation about what the Bells can do. Yes, so Erzimat decided to buy uh, Bell 429 in 2012. It was pretty much new in the market, especially uh, search and rescue equipped. And we were truly impressed by then. I mean, we do about 1,900 helicopter missions per year at some quite challenging conditions up to uh, more than 15,000 feet. And we have to admit that so far it never failed and we're able to do those very high demanding rescue missions under um, some very challenging conditions. And that's why we bought a second one in May uh, of last year and both search and rescue helicopters are now Bell 429s and Jonathan will now talk some specifics about it and some other um, helicopters in his fleet. Thank you. So first of all, I'd like to open this up to say thank you guys for all that you guys do because uh, without you guys, none of this would be possible. And at the end of the day, you guys are the heroes. You are the heroes in your respective regions and your countries and the territories that you guys work. And uh, when you, I mean, the way that we look at it and the emergency aspect of the helicopter is, you know, when, when somebody is injured and needs to be taken away on a helicopter, you know, the, uh, the flight nurses and the medics and the doctors, the patient depends on you. And then you guys that are working there in the cabin, you guys depend on the pilots. And at the end, the pilots depend on the platform that they're flying. That's why I'm proud to be here on behalf of Bell to say that thank you for everything that you guys do. So I'm just going to go over a small general of our platforms that we have at Bell. Um, at first, we had the Bell 505. It was just certified over a year ago. And accomplishment is we delivered over 100 505s last year, uh, up to 100. Uh, the 525 Relentless is actually going through certification. And... Uh, it will be the first fly-by-wire certification helicopter uh, in the world. Uh, on the Bell uh, 407 GXI, we announced that last year, and that's with the new avionics upgrade with the uh, and, uh, the uh, Garmin 1000 and XI. And then uh, we also announced a uh, partnership with uh, Sabaru uh, to upgrade the 407 with the EPX. But what I want to talk to you about today is the Bell 429. So how many people... Uh, have flown in a bell, if you don't mind raising your hands. That's quite a bit. So <coughs> we do have a strong legacy, and that's one thing that we're very proud about at Bell. Just to kind of give you a general overview of uh, Bell in Europe, uh, my home base is Prague, Czech Republic, and that's where we invested in a customization and finalization center. So the helicopters that are assembled in Canada come over to Prague and we do the customization. We're a part 21J organization for design and also a part 145 for maintenance. And in regards to what's very, very important at Bell is support and aftermarket. So we have a supply center in Amsterdam where we provide parts through all over Europe, um, Middle East and Africa. And also in regards to 
uh, blade repair. We have that in the UK. And if uh, the pilots don't want to go to Texas and eat some good barbecue, uh, we have a training solution for the 429 in Valencia, Spain. Now, the 49 around the world, we have over 350 in operation globally, and uh, over 50 uh, in HEMS type uh, operations. Now, some of the safety features that are designed into the 429, uh, I won't go through all of them because some of them are in later in my presentation, but some good things to talk about is we have damage tolerant blades, dual hydro hydraulics. Uh, another important thing is the 30 minute dry run on the transmission. And some of these other things I'll go over, but uh, this was certified in 2009 to the latest certification standards by Transport Canada, FAA, EASA, and all the other certification aviation authorities around the world. Uh, one of the things that I like to highlight about the Bell 429 in regards to the safety, because it's certified to the latest requirements, is that we have fully adjustable energy attenuating seats. We do have a uh, roll bar ring, so in a case of a worst case scenario where you roll over, you're protected in the cabin. And plus also we have rupture resistant fuel cells. So uh, this helicopter had to go through a drop test at 50 feet with the uh, fuel cells with full of fuel. And after the drop test, there was no leaks. And so safety just remains one of our priorities. And because it's certified to the latest standards, it has these features. Another aspect I'll like talk about is the spacious cabin. So we have uh, 204, uh, or we have 5.78 square meters of uh, continuous cabin space. And th there's three different configurations here. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, if you look to the top, you have uh, two uh, medics in the back with two patients. Or you could do, well, if you like some more room, you could have the two medics with one patient or you could have three with one patient. So we, it, the, the good thing about the 429 has a lot of space in the cabin and it's very flexible to the type of operations that you guys uh, perform uh, every day. In regards to the uh, 429 cabin, <coughs> in that market segment, uh, we compete against uh, different products and you guys are, are aware, you know, Augusta, Euro, uh, Airbus, and Leonardo, I'm well, the same. But uh, what we like to say though is the Bell 429 actually has a pretty big size cabin and it's almost the same size of an H145. So the continuous volume, as I said, is 5.78 square meters against the uh, H145, which is 6.04. One thing that we really talk about when it comes to the Bell 429 is the side loading capability. So you have 157 centimeters uh, side loading capability unobstructed. So a lot of the uh, the medical interiors that we actually design comes with that side loading capability. And it gives you extra room to uh, be able to move in and out for egress and degress. Now if you do have a requirement in your operations to have rear loading, what's really important is to make sure you have plenty of space back there um, just, just to ensure that you're safe and everybody is safe. So what we did is we designed the clamshell doors to actually be snug up across the cabin, as you can see here. So um, if you do have that uh, requirement, uh, we're able to uh, provide that to you as well. Comfort, so when I go around and uh, show the 429 to uh, various operators throughout my region, uh, the one thing that they talk about is the ease of the pilot controls, uh, how easy it is to fly the, the actual bird and the visibility that you get in the cabin. So uh, they just feel very comfortable and they feel very, uh, um, just like they're at home. So they really enjoy the visibility in the cockpit. Uh, one thing that we do uh, like about our 429 is the, uh, the low vibration level. So if you're working in the back, you're working in the front as a pilot, we know there's vibrations when you're flying around and that increases your fatigue levels. And so what we did at Bell is we actually design something that actually dampers out the vibrations from the rotor head into the cabin, which I'll show you on the next slide. But what we like to say is throughout all these other models, we're right at the goodness level on the vibration scales to human sensitivity. And here's just a little design of our pylon mounts that we have that uh, does the dampering for us. And so we call it live mounts at Bell. 
It's liquid inertia vibration eliminant. So let me get into a little bit about the performance. So some of the uh, key differentiators that I talked about at the Bell 429 is the performance in high altitudes. So with the Higgy and Hoagy performance, you're around 14,000 feet with Higgy and 11,000 feet with Hoagy with a service ceiling around almost up to 19,000 feet. And these numbers are at max gross weight. And then also it's a fast bird too. It could go up to 150 knots, max continuous speed. So, and also the Pratt Whitney engines give us the power to be able to perform to these, to these numbers. And also with that being said, uh, with the rate of climb, um, it's actually pretty fast as well. And this is one of my favorite pictures actually uh, that we have. Another thing with the Bell 429 is the cost of ownership. So when you look at the whole acquisition, you know, it's a very expensive platform to, to have, you know, a uh, helicopter uh, operation uh, in your region. So what we look at is not just the acquisition cost, but what is that value going to do to you over 10, 15 years from now? And so what we did at Bell is we really took that to heart on what's the direct maintenance cost and direct operating cost. So one thing with Bell is we, we like to add exceptional value to operations. So if you look at the whole um, timeline of 15 year operations, that we're one of the lowest in that segment. And one of the reasons why is because we designed it for maintenance. So the Bell 429 is one of the uh, only helicopters that has the MSG3 maintenance certification. So now uh, the MSG3 is mainly for fixed wing but uh, we took that concept to the Bell 429. So as you can see, the pictures on the left, uh, we have large access panels on both sides. So, you, so you're able to reach to those items or to those uh, components where you need to do uh, your major inspections. And customer support and services. So um, as I said earlier, uh, the Bell brand is very, very, uh, one of our core priorities is basically make sure that you're operating every day because if your aircraft's on the ground and someone needs to be rescued, that could be a danger. So what we do is we make sure that your bird is up flying at all times and we've been rated number one in customer support for a long time. So in my conclusion about the Bell 429, uh, not get into a whole sales bin, but uh, you know, what people say is you know, we have great uh, pilot controls, controls and uh, visibility. Uh, we have large cabin with uh, superior side loading capability. Um, we're a market leader when it comes to high altitude. Um, you know, fantastic life cycle cost. And also, um, yeah, and that's it. So I want to thank you so much for your time. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to stop by. I'll be uh, all around all evening. So thank you very much. Okay, so uh, again, a big thanks to our sponsors, uh, and I hope you stop by all their stands uh, during this conference. Next up is Tim Harris, who will talk about early resuscitation of trauma shock. Take it away, Tim. Uh, I've been followed. This is quite interesting. Oh, I've got a tail. Um, Daniel Mills, organisers, thank you so much for inviting me back. It's an absolute honour to be here. Thank you for staying so late in the day. I hope you had good skiing today since you weren't um, trying to play ultrasound. So my name's Tim Harris. I work as Professor of Emergency Medicine at Barts Health. And um, what... Sorry, guys, I think the battery must have died on that. Can we just swap for yours? We'll just pop yours in for now. Thanks, Ian. Uh, while we wait for that, I have a small announcement. Uh, there has been found a small earring. If you miss one, then uh, please contact our friends over there. 
in uh, when we're done. Okay. I don't have any other announcements. Sorry. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think I'm just going to. I'm getting excellent ideas from you in here. Tell a joke, sing a song. Uh, I think I'm sorry. I'm gonna have to disappoint you. Uh, we'll save it for later. Yeah. I think we're done with cheese. A lot of people signed up to the fondue tomorrow. We've ordered a ton of cheese. <laughs> cheese workers are now working overtime. This seems like a step backwards. <laughs> yeah. All right. Again, for those of you who haven't uh, done the Hamilton questionnaire, still plenty of time. And we also have a surprise uh, raffle on Friday morning, which you'll hear more about. But more prizes are to be won. Okay, Tim, you ready? I'm so sorry about that. This has actually been used uh, twice today and it's been a well-behaved computer. I think I was just out of batteries. So um, my name's Tim Harris and I work as Professor of Emergency Medicine in Bart's Health. Uh, Bart's Health is in East London, which is arguably the most colourful area of the city. It's where each new set of immigration happens and it's an area full of contrasts. We've got the richest area in the UK, Canary Wharf, with banking, advertising agencies. And then we've got one of the poorest, um, from Newham up to Victoria Park on the south end of Murder Park. It's a wonderful place. Please come visit. This is the Royal London Hospital. Uh, so London hems, hangs around up here. This is the old London Hospital, which was a, a workhouse. And uh, we've got this nice new building. It's blue because, of course, uh, London always has bright blue skies. It just reminds us of that. Um, this year I'm working out in Qatar. Um, Qatar is a tiny little nipple off the end of Saudi Arabia with some more liberal laws. Uh, it's a huge emergency department. It sees about uh, 1,800 patients a day. So it's overwhelming. So what I'd like to do for the next 20, 25 minutes is just revisit a bit of medical history. Hypotensive or hypovolemic resuscitation moved on tremendously in what we understand and know about formal resuscitation. We introduced tranexamic acid, blood product based resuscitation, improved our imaging, our surgery, our intervention in radiology. So I'm just going to look back at this because it's an area of intense emotion for many people. And some years ago we looked at having a European trial and the doctors that were wedded to full volume resuscitation and targeting always organ perfusion said you can't do this, it's unethical, you've got to give high volume resuscitation. The doctors that liked hypovolemic resuscitation and believed in targeting hemostasis over organ perfusion said you can't do this, it's unethical. And I hope at the end of this talk we will come to a conclusion we need a European trial because I think we need to put this question in the context of blood based blood product resuscitation see if it matters or not. So, hypo, oh sorry, so blood loss is an important cause of death. If you go back 20 years, it was accounting for just under half deaths. Most series now suggest it accounts for between 20 and 35 percent. So the proportion of patients dying from blood loss is falling, but nonetheless, there's plenty we can do to improve. It goes without saying, best blood you're ever going to get is the stuff that's circulating in all your bodies now. So the first stage of any resuscitation is to preserve your own circulating volume. Tourniquets, pressure dressing, splints and cautious handling, taking your patients with minimal clot disturbance to their local trauma centre. So the current paradigm, certainly where I work, is damage control resuscitation. So a resuscitation process where we target coagulation over organ perfusion. This consists of a blood product based resuscitation in the London Hospital. This is the, the first pack, a combination of fresh frozen plasma 
red cells, and then with the addition of fibrinogen and platelet subsequently. So to avoid all crystalloid, because we have concerns that any crystalloid, even as low as 250 or 500 mils in that initial stage, may worsen coagulopathy. Of convention, we target a lower blood pressure. Most studies have suggested 90 millimetres of mercury. I'm going to come back to what that pressure should be in the next few slides. And of course, we move our patients rapidly to imaging and then rapidly to theatre. All part of the damage control process. So first of all, I think we need to ask ourselves, who needs damage control resuscitation? Who needs a massive transfusion protocol? And of course, what we want to know is which patients are bleeding and need the attention of a surgeon or interventionist to stop the tap. These are patients that we give fluid resuscitation to that respond not at all or transiently. There are tools out there. Um, I mentioned the TASH and the ABC score. I've not seen anything to suggest they perform better than an experienced clinician. And certainly where I work, they're not in widespread use. From what I can see, they're better at predicting who doesn't need a transfusion than who does. ATLS has brought many, many things, not least of all the idea of the primary survey, and made trauma care an international language. We can walk into any trauma system and have an idea of what our colleagues in France, Holland, Italy, Switzerland are doing. And the structure would probably be similar. But one thing I take exception to is this idea that there is a nice, neat physiological relationship between a loss of blood and a certain set of physiological parameters. I've worked in trauma centers since 1991, and I'm struggling to find a patient that I really think fits into this classification. And if we look at the literature, we find that it would back that idea up. So TAM, the Trauma Audit Search Network in the UK, um, published um, a case, uh, sorry, a cohort study based on its database, and all patients, stage one to stage four shock, had a pulse less than, a median pulse, that is, less than 100. And then even in stage four shock, the median systolic was north of 120. American literature says much the same thing. This is work by Eastbridge. It's based on 900,000 patient records in the U.S. trauma database. And this is the paper that told us that the mortality in trauma doesn't begin at a systolic of 90. It begins a systolic of 110. And not surprisingly, that value will be less for young adults, 80 to 90, than middle age, 90 to 100, or old age, where it's around 120. So let's look at hypotensive resuscitation. The idea that we are going to leave our patients hypovolemic and hypotensive and the focus will be on restoring their coagulation profile. So what pressure would we use? Most studies suggest 90. But most studies also report the achieved blood pressure is very different from the targeted blood pressure. If our patients are talking, it's pretty easy. We can let the blood pressure drift down as long as the cerebral function. When our patients are intubated and ventilated and we can't assess CNS flow by function, it becomes much harder. Arguably, we need to keep our diastolic sufficient to perfuse our heart and our systolic, uh, sorry, our MAP to perfuse our brain. And of course, that's going to be slightly different for all of us and different with different ages. But I think it's a lot lower than 90 and we can probably let that MAP drift down to 50 or 55. And we'll come back to a little bit of data to support that later on. So there may not be one single target for all. Animal data. So there's a wealth of small and large animal data. And this teaches us that if we bleed out to a critical volume, we all die. If we bleed out to a critical volume and replace, or a subcritical volume, so less than 40 to 50% of your circulating volume, then if we give you a subtotal replacement, we replace less than the volume less, we practice hypovolemic resuscitation, then those patients have a higher survival, better coagulation profile, 
less acidosis. So animal data points strongly in favor of hypotensive resuscitation. But the animal models are not good fits for humans. Most of it is penetrating trauma. So it's either a, a Wiggers model where you're chopping a tail or you're doing an aortotomy or you're creating a specific lesion, usually a liver laceration. And these are much more simple injuries and the resuscitation process has begun usually after five or 10 minutes rather than the 45 or 60 minutes to get people into ED or the 30 minutes to get us out to scene. I'd like to just look at some work the British military did following the recent conflicts. So improvised explosive devices produce horrific injuries and we've seen things like blast lung and widespread body-wide blunt trauma that offers a much greater degree of cytokine release and endothelial damage than the animal models before. I'm going to just talk you through one particular experiment because I think this illustrates the point well. And the authors termed this hybrid resuscitation, i.e. a short defined period of hypovolemic resuscitation and then restoring volume and organ perfusion even before we've uh, done a surgical procedure or an interventional radiological procedure. So this was a large um, animal model using pigs. The pigs were all subject to a blast or no blast and then had a 30% blood volume removed through a femoral catheter. So all had a hypovolemic injury, half had a blast injury, half had no blast injury. The pigs were then resuscitated to pig normotension of 110 or pig hypotension of 80. Note, this resuscitation was all saline, no blood products. And the resuscitation was begun only five minutes after the injury. So the take-home message is the pigs subject to blast injury and hypotensive resuscitation did much badly than those that received high-volume resuscitation to restore a blood pressure of 110. There is other animal data, but I just wanted to illustrate this one um, piece of work. So let's move on to humans going to see this as pre-hospital, ED, and then theatre studies. So most of the work has been done pre-hospital. And the biggest trial is now 25 years old. This is the Bicknell trial published in the New England. It recruited patients that had penetrated trauma, a systolic less than 90, and were being taken to one trauma centre. It was randomised by days of the week, so people involved in the trial knew what day of the week and what to expect. The patients randomised to the restrictive fluid group who ideally by protocol got no fluid resuscitation before their definitive surgical procedure and those that had the paradigm of the time high volume resuscitation following ATLS recommendations. The protocol was reasonably well adhered to and those in the low fluid group got less fluid, considerably less, 1,600 versus just under 300 mils, and had a better survival, which was significant by p-value and confidence intervals. And this trial changed practice for many of us. It certainly did for me when I was working in Australia at the time. The problem is, one, the blood pressure was the same in both groups when they arrived at hospital. And we see this consistently, that our body's hemostasis restores a blood pressure almost regardless of what we do and what drugs and what uh, blood products or crystalloid we infuse. Secondly, the only benefit was in the subgroup with cardiac and major vessel injuries. It wasn't generalized um, to the recruited population. It was a non-blinded study. It was pseudo-randomized. And actually, one in 12 patients that were randomized to the no-fluid group got fluid. Perhaps that was the one in 12 patients that had been subject to sufficient blood loss to have a critical hypovolemic shock, which the treating teams feared would be fatal without intervention. And of course, that trial was way before damage control resuscitation and blood products and tranexamic acid. So there's two, there's uh, 11 cohort studies. I'm just going to highlight two of them, both um, from the German 
database because I think it draws on Swiss, Austrian and German patients from what I understand. So this is uh, 7,000, 7,500 patients with uh, ISS of greater than 15, almost all blunt trauma, and the odds ratio of death increased progressively with higher volumes of fluid resuscitation, particularly in those without brain injury. Different authors, same database, match 948 patients with what they describe as low volume resuscitation, that's less than 1,500 mils pre-hospital, versus high volume, which is greater than 1,500. I guess certainly where David and I work, 1,500 mils would be regarded as a high volume pre-hospital resuscitation most of the time. And this matched patients um, showed an increased risk of death and an increased risk of high volume transfusion. So low, vo sorry, low volume resuscitation reduced the blood products required. I don't think this trial got nearly the attention it deserved. This is the newest pre-hospital trial. It was carried out by Schreiber and colleagues in uh, 18 ambulance services in North America. And this was to test the hypothesis that the American military resuscitation process could apply into the civilian environment. They recruited patients with blunt and penetrating trauma, systolic less than 90, and then they were randomized to two groups. The control group got 2,000 mils of STAP um, fluid, which was crystalloid, and aimed to be resuscitated to a systolic of 110. The intervention group were allowed to drift down to a systolic of 70 before they got an intervention, and the intervention was bolus of 250 mils of fluid, um, aiming to keep the systolic above 70. The primary endpoint of this trial, this was feasibility trial, was just to say, is there a difference in fluid delivered between the two groups? Previous pre-hospital trials, particularly Turner's trial in the UK, had shown that wasn't the case. And they did. So they had 1,000 in the low and 2,000 mils in the high volume, suggesting that they could deliver the protocol pre-hospital. The most important secondary outcome was mortality. In blunt trauma and penetrating trauma, the numbers of patients dying in the restrictive resuscitation group was less, and it, it reached um, significance, surprisingly, in the blunt not the penetrating group. And I hope these authors go on to do a large trial and uh, answer the question. What about ED? I'm aware of only one randomized trial in the ED. This was published back in 2002 or 2004 um, by Richard Dutton. It was carried out at Baltimore Shock Trauma. And in this study, they recruited patients with blunt and penetrating disease and targeted them to either a systolic of 100 or 70. They only recruited 110 patients, and the trial ran over three years. And the authors felt that so much had changed in the way they delivered care that it was meaningless to continue the trial, and they stopped prematurely. The mortality was equal in both groups and was much lower than expected. And not surprisingly, the trial therefore showed no difference. What about in the operating theatre? So this trial was published a couple of years ago and randomised patients with initially blunt and penetrating trauma, but it was published using only the penetrating trauma because in the first interim analysis, more patients with blunt trauma were allocated to high volume and they wanted to get rid of that as a co-founder. So. 168 patients in the final analysis. Those patients were young adults with a systolic of less than 90 who needed emergent thoracotomy or laparotomy. They were randomized to either have a target map of 50 or 65. This trial showed that the groups, that the blood pressure targets were much higher in the that so the blood pressures reported were much higher than the targets, as previous trials have shown, but there was a significant difference between the low and high pressure target group. Renal failure was more common in the low pressure group, and when you look at the differences in fluid received, the only difference was in plasma. The low 
volume group got around a litre less plasma than the high volume group. Red cells, vasopressors and crystalloid was the same. And I think we've just seen two pre-hospital trials looking at plasma. One of those trials shows a surprising mortality benefit for you know, half a litre of plasma. And it's interesting that in this study, where the only difference was plasma, um, we didn't see the same effect. And mortality, whether you're looking out at uh, 30 days or early mortality in the first few days, showed no difference between the two groups. And the trial was stopped early for futility. What about meta-analysis? So NICE published its uh, guideline for major trauma a couple of years ago. The authors felt that the only useful data or high quality data was drawn from Dutton's trial and Bickle's trial. So they combined that data and suggested that 24-hour mortality should be lower if we practice restrictive hypotension and 30-day mortality should be lower if we practice restrictive hypotension. The newest meta-analysis came out around four months ago and this included all the trials that I've shown. I'm going to come back onto that next slide. Sorry, and the pooled result showed a survival benefit in favour of the low volume group. The problem is all the trials are low quality, the blinding's unclear, the randomization process is unclear, and they included five trials. This is the same trial. This happens to include those blunt uh, trauma patients that were pulled out in the final analysis. So one of the biggest conflicts we face is what to do with traumatic brain injury. Those of us that believe in the concept of permissive hypovolemia, permissive hypotension, are faced with the difficulty that most guidelines suggest we should be looking for a systolic of 90 to 110. NICE has a very pragmatic answer. It just says, as the clinician, choose the dominant injury, be it the brain injury or the leading injury, and target for that. This is a trial that came out uh, last year that I just wanted to point out. So these authors looked at just under 4,000 patients, and they wanted to ask, at what systolic do we see a change in mortality in patients with head injury? So we've had this figure of 90 thrown at us from observational trials. And not surprisingly, the authors found that for every 10 millimetres of mercury increase, there was a uh, fall in the death rate. So for trauma patients, there's a nice linear line. The more hypotensive you are, the worse you do. So in summary, permissive hypovolemia is a passive process. We're targeting hemostasis. I think we need to forget about specific blood pressure targets. There's better data for penetrating than blunt disease. We don't really know for how long we can leave our patients hypovolemic, but there is some animal data to suggest that as we go longer than an hour, we start to see organ failure that is arguably preventable. We're now in an age of blood product-based resuscitation. And I think the time has come to us to ask ourselves the question, do we need to do a trial of permissive hypotension and hypovolemia in the setting of damage control resuscitation using blood products? Because I think we're still in a position of equipoise. So I'd like to thank you very much. What I've said here, um, I published with Corinne Browie and colleagues in the current opinion. No, I didn't. I covered in <laughs> emergency medicine clinics of North America. It's a very, very long article, but it goes into these things in much more detail. So I'll thank you for your time. So thank you. Uh, are there any questions for Tim? Geir, do you have a question? No. We'll talk more about uh, trauma and blood and transfusions and stuff tomorrow. Next up is Benedict Lawrence. And uh, after that, we'll all go up to the bar. Are you ready, Benedict? Thank you.
Hello everyone. Uh, at this moment I would like to keep calm and do some yoga like Sophie said, um, but I think you all want to go to the bar, so I will start. Um, first of all, I would like to say thank you to Thomas that you invite me to return to Zermatt where I had last year a very nice time and I think we will have a great time this year. And he asked me to um, tell a little bit how we treat bleeding patients in Essen. And while I show you some pictures from the hospital or from the city where I work, do a few uses viscoelastic tests in his hospital. So we have experience here. And two of you uses pure factor concentrates in his hospital. So as well. My name is Benedict, like you said before, and I'm an anesthesiologist. I work as an intensivist and emergency physician, but I do not have any conflicts of interests. But in our hospital, we use the rotor machine since 1999. So that means I never did it another way. To understand a little bit why I'm so enthusiastic with the way how we treat bleeding patients, it's necessary to know a little bit about my curriculum vitae. I first started as a, to work as a paramedic in a, sorry for you Martin, in a rural area <laughs> in West Germany. Um, then I moved to Graz where I met Martin who's with me this year and is a good friend of mine now and he's an anesthesiologist. And in Graz there I also met Professor Gombert who introduced me in patient blood management. And in Graz, I saw the first time a rotor machine. I saw a BBC documentary about the British Armed Forces in Afghanistan, and they had a machine that was able to measure coagulation. And I was fascinated. I googled a little bit, and then I found the papers from Gerling et al. from Essen, and then I moved there to become an anesthesiologist. This is where I work now. This is the University Hospital in Essen. It's in the west part of Germany. And as you see here, it is a, um, uh, it is a metropolitan area. The main, uh, the rural main, the rural area, like we said, or the, like we said in this area, the Ruhrpott. And the Ruhrpott begins when you drive down the Rhine River, and it starts behind Düsseldorf. This area, they live 5.1 million people, and this area consists of 15 cities. We have many football clubs. The biggest are Dortmund and Schalke. We have more than 50 breweries in this area. And um, traditionally, 50 years ago, there worked more than 600,000 people as uh, miners in heavy industry. So that means we had many major traumas those days. And um, this is the reason why we have two rescue helicopters since more than 40 years in this area. Next to the hospital where I live, we do have four more hospitals to treat major um, uh, injured patients. One of these hospitals is the Bergmannsheil in Bochum, which is the oldest trauma hospital in the world. And like the name says, it was built to treat injured miners, and um, it's more than 130 years old. And we have that beautiful uh, trauma center in Duisburg, where Jana Stamen worked before he moved to Berlin, and he allowed me to use some of his pictures. Thank you very much. Why is it necessary to transfuse as little blood as possible? As you can see on the left side, the numbers of blood donates are um, decreasing in Germany. And yeah, as you can see in the circle diagram, most of this blood we use for cancer therapy and heart diseases, and these are the diseases of the elderly patients, and we have an, expect, uh, uh, an increasing life expectancy in Germany. So this silver tsunami leads to us that we will run out of blood. There are also some medical reasons why we should avoid inappropriate blood transfusions because we know that mortality, morbidity, and the costs are very hi are higher in patients who receive blood transfusions. There are still some risks that are associated with blood transfusions. They are rare, but they exist. And even after years, the mortality is higher after blood transfusions. We know from different studies that restrictive blood transfusion strategies have the same outcome uh, like liberal transfusion strategies. And we know that patient blood management is an evidence-based procedure to reduce the need for blood transfusions. The crux of transfusion is that transfusion of red blood cells does not automatically increase the tissue perfusion, which is our first target. We know this since a very long time. And I stole from Herbert Schechel from Salzburg this slide where he showed us that the mortality was higher on helicopters who used blood products. I know this is not the finest statistic for those who have a PhD in statistic, <laughs> but I just want to show. Um, we have also some risk with the transfusion of platelets. Our own hospital, we saw that uh, the transfusion of platelets is an in, uh, independent risk for higher mortality in patients with liver transplantation. 
And uh, we know that in my hospital that platelets is a warm fluid and we have a higher risk in transfusion uh, warm fluids. I'm sure we will hear uh, about platelets a few in the following days. Even the plasma transfusion is associated with higher mortality, with higher septic events, and a higher rate of septic events, and with RDS. And uh, we saw the same effect in trauma patients. This is my daughter. Uh, in the, her lifetime, before she was infected by Anna and Elsa from sh Frozen, those days she read books from Gerinnung, which is the German word for coagulation. And if I ask her, what is a good vessel, she would say to me, a good vessel is a vessel that keeps the fluids inside. And I think that every definition is very good. This is my hospital where I work now. We do 28,000 anesthetic procedures per year, and many of them have a high risk of massive bleeding, like intracranial operation, many liver transplantation, and many aortic dissection. In 2018, we did 25 mass transfusions, but we spent 1 million euro for concentrates. <coughs> Sorry. These are the uh, surgical departments in my hospital, and you see over there the laboratory. But in my hospital, we have many ECMOs, uh, many ROTEMs. Many ECMOs too, but many ROTEMs. And um, we have, like I said before, we use them since more than 20 years. And because we have so many rotor machines, it's quite normal that if you have a bleeding patient, it is quite normal that we have two or three rotor machines in parallel use to find out what the patient needs. Here you see a view into our um, cardiothoracic um, uh, theater. And you see that we use the rotor machine as a real bedside test. And um, usually we have the results from the rotor machine faster than the results from the standard laboratory tests. And of course, always, but the tests are faster than the blood tests arrive in, this in the laboratory. Sorry. How does the rotor machine work? You have a cup of blood in an alternating rotating axis inside. And now the blood is clotting in the cup and the resistance is increasing. And this is drawn graphically on the time axis. We have four channels in, in parallel use. And then you can see something like this. At the beginning, you have the clotting time, which depends on the enzymatic um, coagulation factors. Then we have the clot maximum firmness, which is how strong, which shows us how strong the clot is. That depends on the platelets of on fibrinogen, on factor 13 and is uh, reduced by dilution. And usually, the clot consists longer than the 90 minutes, like a standard Rotem test. If the clot is breaking down before, we have a hyperfibrinolysis, which is associated with higher mortality and with massive transfusion. This is the Essner Runde algorithm. I just found it in German, sorry for this. It is very important that we can, as anesthesiologists, only treat bleeding patients, okay? We cannot stuff the hole in the aorta, then we still need a surgeon who puts his, hand on his hands on. So it's necessary to have a bleeding patient. So always have a view into s inside of your patient and look what the coagulation does. If everything is fine in your rotum, but the patient has a diffuse bleeding, then please check the calcium concentration the body temperature, or does the patient has any problems with his thrombocytes, then we have to do further tests. What I want to show you to here, that we can put different medication into the cups when, you do the, when we have the, the four different channels. So um, we can put temporary NAS inside, so we can do the first um, Rotem test while the patient is still on cardiopulmonary bypass. Then we can measure out the effect of heparin, and we know what the patient will need when we go off the bypass and everything is prepared when we, when we, after we put the protamine in. And we can put some tranexamic acid inside, then we see the effect of aptin. Traditionally or historically, uh, we used pro uh, aprotinine. This is the reason why it's called aptin test, but today we put some tranexamic acid inside. And this is what it looks like then. We are prepared and we know after 10 to 15 minutes what the patient needs. You see it on the left side in an aortic um, re uh, replacement therapy. A surgery, um, we know what the patient needs and give it. When we have a patient with a bleeding, uh, with a diffuse, diffuse bleeding, then first we start with tranexamic acid. You see in this rotum that the clot breaks down and um, very early before, um, and you know that this patient will not um, receive effective coagulation. In my hospital, in Germany, we have on 98% of all emergency vehicles, we have um, tranexamic acid. So this 
um, hyperfibrinolysis is very rare in trauma patients in Germany. But um, we can discuss the whole day or the whole night about the evidence of tranexamic acid. In my definition, use it, okay? Don't be afraid. It is cheap, it is effective, and um, it works. In our hospital, we give the tranexamic acid always as boluses. We don't give it over eight hours because we do so many rotems that we are not afraid to overlook the hyperfibrinolysis secondary. So we give the tranexamic acid whenever there's a hyperfibrinolysis and not like in the CRASH-2 trial. The second thing is the fibrinogen. We know that fibrinogen is necessary for the plasmatic coagulation and for um, the clot firmness. And we do not have a fibrinogen store in our body. So fibrinogen is that coagulation factor that decreases first and reaches critical low um, levels. So here you see a rotem after, uh, these are different rotems in different times and you see what happens when we, when we put the fibrinogen inside. At the beginning we have a flat line and then we have a stronger, um, a stronger clot and you see that also the in X term the clotting time is decreasing because the clotting time depends on the availability of fibrinogen. This great study group, international group, some of them are here, I believe. Um, they found out that uh, the critical um, level when the outcome is poor f is around about 2.3 gram per liters. You always have to check, are they talking about the concentration in blood or the concentration in plasma, but this is academic. <coughs> so um, the critical level is 2.3. And we know from different studies like the METAS trial or that study from, from Japan that they have positive effects when they um, put some fibrinogen additional into the patient. And how should we substitute the fibrinogen? Here we have a simulation, a patient with a baseline fibrinogen of 0 0.9, which is a typical massive bleeding patient. And they want to reach a target level of 2.0, Sorry, two gram per liters. If you want, if you have in your hospital a one to one to one trauma mass transfusion protocol, you have the problem that you give uh, four units of plasma to this patient, then the, HBA, the hemoglobin concentration is decreasing, then you give two units of red blood, then the fibrinogen is decreasing, then you give platelets and everything is decreasing. So it is necessary to give the concentrates as poor as possible. You can use cryo or you can use the fibrinogen concentrate. In my hospital, we do not have cryo. We have the concentrate and um, um, the cryo is frozen, so it's uh, not so fast available like the concentrate. In this study group, they had no positive effect when they put some fibrinogen to their bleeding patient. But when you have a further look, they never reached the 2.3 gram per liters until the patient produces his own fibrinogen because it's an acute fast protein. And another indication when we use fibrinogen, these are the patients who go to the, um, with, with, with um, thorax pain, they go to the, to, the, to the hospital and then they think it's a, it's a STEMI, they put the patient on the coronary angiography, um, put some ticker low inside and then they see, oops, it's not a STEMI, it is an aortic dissection. I had two cases in one year and then they come to our hospital and have no bleeding. In this situation, you have two, two, two chances how you can treat them. Either you give 20 units of plasma, or like we do, we give one or two units of plasma, uh, sorry, platelets, platelets, <laughs> and uh, many grams of fibrinogen. The next thing is the protomine complex. Like I said before, the clotting time depends on the availability of fibrinogen. Here again. And usually we use uh, the plasma to increase the iron air, but this was, not it wa this was not effective in the study. It doesn't matter how many plasma you give, the iron air doesn't, doesn't uh, increase. Another possibility when you can put uh, plasma or PCC inside of the patient is when the patient is uh, under the effect of uh, oral um, anticoagulation therapy, we use uh, PCC in this situation and this uh, um, Results are more than 10 years old, but also last year we had this study from the United States where they used Cassandra and they had the same effect that they had. Uh, it was feasible to decrease the uh, anticoagulation effect. And I found one paper <laughs> that uh, PCC is also good for endothelopathy. 
if the clot is not strong enough, but you have enough fibrinogen in your blood, this is the, the situation when you have to give platelets. So again, first start with tranexamic acid, because it does not make sense to give fibrinogen when it is um, consumed. Then give the fibrinogen, then give the PCC, and if it is necessary, give the, uh, the platelets. Where the clot is, the embolism is not far. In our hospital, we usually start with the anticoagulation therapy after trauma or after um, operation, four to six hours. This is a patient who received in the ICU because he had a massive trauma and an intracranial hemorrhage, and he received many uh, clotting factors in the uh, neurosurgery um, theater. And we had to wait a little bit because he had intracranial hemorrhage, and then we used these food pumps to avoid um, thromboembolic events. Now I would like to show you some examples. This is our trauma bay. We have four more for of them. And this is a 20-year-old patient who was found unconscious uh, in the track bag. And um, as you can see, when you have a look into the red, the blue, and the brown channel, that this patient is not able to put a, cl uh, to put a clot. And when you put now some tonic cymic acid to this patient, you see that the clot is much stronger. But this patient also needs on top fibrinogen, uh, platelets, or PPSB, or PCC. And now we have the problem that if you want to, re to give some volume, um, which is the best volume? In our hospital, we do not have whole blood. We do not have plasma available because we have to throw on it. And we use 4% um, succinylated gelatin because gelatin has only dilutional effects of the coagulation. So we and this effect is totally reversible with fibrinogen and factor 13. Um, in HAS, you have the coating of the thrombocytes, which is, which is not so good. A second um, example, this is an elderly woman who was hit by a car. She was unconscious with a GCS of 3 when the um, emergency physician arrived. He intubated her and gave 1.5 liters of crystalloids, which is a lot. And then she arrived in the hospital. What is very important in this um, example? Our target in diffuse bleeding patient is much higher than in the international studies. When we have a look to the Feisty trial in, the, uh, in the Australia, that the FIPTOM target is around about 10 millimeters. In this situation, the patient received so many fibrinogen until the FIPTOM was 24 millimeters because she had diffuse bleeding. And we give so the fibrinogen until the diffuse bleeding stops. And when you have a view on the second rotum, when we go to the operation theater after the CT scan, this patient has the same coagulation system like a patient or an elective inpatient. Where's the evidence? <laughs> yeah, um, it's low. There are only a few studies, single center studies mainly, but when we have a look to these uh, uh, centers like in Austria, in Innsbruck, where they use uh, the Rotem even since 20 years, or to Salzburg, you see that the mortality is much lower than in those uh, centers who still use one to one to one. And we have this study from uh, in Japan um, when they introduced, sorry, it's a little bit some problem when you put it to a PowerPoint. In Japan, we had the, uh, they decreased the mortality after the introduction of, um, of uh, clotting factors from 50% to 20%. And you can't see it here. We had the same effect in Italy. Uh, Dr. Nadi had um, uh, introduced a rotor machine and factor concentrates to her hospital and the emergency department and the mortality decreased from 20% to 13%. Uh, this is not statistically, but it's effective in my opinion. Everyone is talking about uh, whole blood, so I will do the same. This is a uh, case report, a search for a case report, and this was the first hit. And Mary, Mick and Mike, nee, Mary, Mick and Martin, they had a patient who was hit by a car. This patient received more pl blood products in the first four hours in hospital than I transfused in six months in the cardiothoracic anesthesia. They were not surprised that the clot is not strong, but because only in a half sentence they write it down. So what is the difference? The left picture is from Essen, the right one is from Twitter. You see we have clot on the floor, on the right side there's red water. So and even, you can see it, when you use uh, whole blood, the mortality is still higher. So when you want to give concentrates, please give them as pure as possible. Because when you drink a milk coffee, you use milk and not the milk coffee from your neighbor. 
And if the coagulation is good, your surgeon will be very happy with you. Thank you. Okay, thanks. I, are there any questions at all? Yes, in the back. For the internet, we need the microphone, so just give us a sec. Hi, uh, Phil Spinella, St. Louis. Hi. Please go back to the slide with the table, please. With what? The slide with your table. I want to uh, oh, yeah. help you interpret that data. The table, not that picture. Right. So you have to understand there's more than just the ISS that needs to be evaluated when you do this type of analysis. Right? The transport time, uh, very likely, we don't know it because you're not showing it, it wasn't uh, reported, but transport times in the U.S. could be much longer than it can be in the countries that you're uh, depicting here as well. The admission uh, m measures of physiology, coagulopathy and shock, uh, hypothermia, all affect outcomes. So this is a very disingenuous slide that's extremely misleading. I've now seen it three or four times from um, the, the group in, uh, groups from Austria and in, in, in Germany. And someone needs to speak up and make you aware of, of how misleading this is when you present it in the way uh, you present it. Thank you for the critics. This uh, is correct, I think. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So thank you for that comment. Um, are there any other questions? Yeah. I, I have a question. Since uh, the, uh, the basic of your approach is that you take plasma and you remove the water, and then you have a powder, and you then you take that powder and you put it in different vials that cost like a thousand dollars a piece, and you add it into your patient. But you have to add the water too. So I would like to know the way the re you resuscitate your patient, because normally the plasma volume of a normal patient with obesity is 55%. The plasma volume in a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one is 38%. That's the volume you're given. So if you, if, if we, we cannot kind of just say that plasma is not a, a part of your volume in your body. So I would like to know when you used your approach and you don't use plasma, what do you use and in what amounts do you use them? Because if you lose like uh, five liters of blood, there's going to be 55% of plasma in that blood and you don't replace the plasma. So what do you replace it with? What kind of volume do you use? And what amounts do you use it with? So our first um, uh, approach is that we use um, uh, red blood cells to the patient who are bleeding and then we replace um, the coagulation factors and um, those patients who lose whole of the blood, of course, they need platelets, of course, um, or perhaps they need plasma. We do um, liver transplantations without um, plasma, but those patients where we can't stop the bleed and they really lose five liters of blood, but this is very rare in our, situ in our hospital, um, then, of course, it could be right to give plasma, but usually it is not necessary because we can stop the bleed before we lose five liters. Yeah, okay. One second. <laughs> Fitz, can you go back to the uh, slide showing the platelet unit? Sorry to make you do this, but I want to make the point. There we go. What's the yellow stuff in that platelet unit? What's what makes it yellow? It's the fibrinogen. No, it's plasma. You have a, basically an entire unit of plasma in a unit of apheresis platelets. So something else that your group keeps on saying that's also misleading. You do give plasma every time you give a platelet unit. Actually, it's almost an ex in a, a full equivalent unit of plasma. So I'm, uh, um, I'm really glad to see this, uh, this uh, um, uh, engagement regarding uh, transfusion uh, and uh, for all of you guys who are excited about transfusion medicine tomorrow we'll have a panel discussion regarding transfusion in trauma featuring Geyer 
Um, so that's awesome. And I re- encourage all of you to continue this discussion at the bar because that's where we're going now.